Welcome to the Amersham Methodist Circuit YouTube channel. I am Nigel Wright, I'm one of the ministers in the Amersham Methodist Circuit. Today is the second Sunday of Lent, and in many of the churches in our circuit, we would usually set up a cross during Lent. And on each Sunday, we would place next to it one of the items that's connected with the death of Jesus. Today, Bridget and Malcolm Appleby from the church in Prestwood will now say a few words that are based on Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. And we're going to hear that read in full a little bit later on during the service. They're going to place an image of nails on the cross and we will listen to the words, Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? O oh Lord our God, we are here, journeying in Lent, and here are nails. As the disciples journeyed with Jesus, he made it very clear he would be put to death. And here are the nails, a reminder of death upon the cross. O oh Lord our God, journey with us. And if we want to journey with you, Jesus said, we must forget self, carry the cross and follow him. O oh Lord our God, journey with us that we may die to sin and rise to life with you. We add nails to our Lenten cross. And then we listen to Were You There When They Nailed Him to the Tree. going to sing a song that proclaims that this our God the servant king calls us now to follow him. It's number 272 in singing the faith, number 272 from heaven you came. <laughs> Now 
to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to learn how to serve and in our lives enthrone him each other's need to prefer for it is Christ we're serving this is our God the servant king he calls us now to fall Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, it is with awe and reverence that we worship you. We proclaim your greatness, we acknowledge your power, we declare your goodness. Compassionate and caring God, it is with grateful hearts that we come to praise you. We come to praise you for your love that constantly surrounds us, whether or not we are aware of it. We come to praise you for the blessings of our lives. We come to praise you for the continuing rollout of the vaccine in this country. We come to praise you for the beauty of creation. And above all, we come to praise you for the hope that you bring us in Jesus Christ. Almighty God, we praise and worship you. Merciful and forgiving God, it is also with sorrow and shame that we come before you. Because we know only too well that we are unworthy of your goodness, but you love us just the same. We know that we have not loved you or one another in the way that you have loved us. And so we come to say that we're sorry and to ask for your forgiveness. Restore us, we pray, to your side. And we pray asking that you will touch our hearts with your loving presence. That you will fill our lives with your grace, so that our love for you may grow, our faith be deepened and our service strengthened. Amen. And we're going to continue in prayer now by saying together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We're now going to sing the, the beautiful Teze chant, In the Lord I'll be ever thankful. We're going to be using a video that's provided by Ruth and Joy Everingham. It's number 776 in Singing the Faith. Number 776. In the Lord I'll be ever thankful. In the Lord I'll be ever thankful. In the Lord I will rejoice. Look to God, do not be afraid. Lift up your voice, says the Lord is here. Lift up your voice, says the Lord is here. In the Lord I'll be ever thankful. In the Lord I will rejoice. Look to God, do not be afraid. Lift up your voice, says the Lord is here. Lift up your voice. 
from the Methodist Church in Chesham is now going to read to us the Old Testament reading that's set for today. It's from Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 to 7. The story of God making a covenant with Abraham and changing his name in the process to Abraham. Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 to 7. Our first reading this morning is from the Old Testament in Genesis and I'm starting reading at the beginning of chapter 17. And if you want to follow it, I'm reading from the NIV version and it's on page 16. It's subheading the covenant of circumcision. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and the God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, which means exalted father. Your name will be Abraham, which means father of many. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful, I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Amen. We're now going to sing a hymn praising the God of Abraham. It's number 91 in Singing the Faith, the current hymn book that's used in the Methodist Church. But we're going to be using a version today from a previous hymn book, the 1933 Methodist hymn book, number 21. And in the 1933 book there were actually 12 verses and we're going to be singing the first six of these. And we're going to be led with their permission by our brothers and sisters in the Ghana Methodist Students' Union Choir. The Ghana Methodist Students' Union Choir. Number 21 in the Methodist Hymn Book. The God of Abraham Prays.
In my preparation for this service, I came across a poem by Stuart Henderson called Splintered Messiah, Splintered Messiah, which I'm now going to read to you. It's a poem that acknowledges that sometimes we might prefer a rather different Jesus from the one that we actually get. All is well when Jesus does what we want him to, but when he takes a different line, it can become a lot more uncomfortable. I don't want a splintered messiah in a sweat-stained, greasy grey robe. I want a new one. I couldn't take this one to parties. People would say, who is your friend? And I'd give an embarrassed giggle and change the subject. If I took him home, I'd have to bandage his hands. The neighbours would think he's a football hooligan. I don't want his cross in the hall. It doesn't go with the wallpaper. I don't want him standing there like a sad ballet dancer with holes in his tights. I want a different messiah, streamlined and inoffensive. I want one from a catalogue who's as quiet as a monastery. I want a package tour messiah, not one who takes me to Golgotha. I want a king of kings with blow waves in his hair. I don't want the true Christ. I want a false one. The Apostle Peter got a different Messiah from the one he thought he was getting. And when he rebuked Jesus for speaking plainly about what would happen to him, Jesus corrected him. Jesus then told the crowd, as well as his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Lynn Walker from the Methodist Church in Chesham is now going to read the passage that's set for today from Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. This reading is from Mark and it can be found on one, page 1012 and I'm starting at the chapter beginning, Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. 
that when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Amen. Are we prepared to follow Jesus? and go where he calls us. We're now going to sing number 673 from Singing the Faith using Matt Beckingham's video of Will You Come and Follow Me? Number 673, Will You Come and Follow Me? Will you come and follow me if I but call your Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind? If I but call your name Will you care for cruel and kind And never be the same Will you risk the hostile stare Should your life attract or scare Will you let me answer prayer in you blinded see if I but call your name will you set the prisoners free and never be the same will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen and admit to what I mean in you and you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you? Your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow. I wonder if the disciples ever met up together in the years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Picture this scene for a moment. The disciples are together. Together talking about the days gone by, laughing, teasing and reminiscing as friends do. And then one of them looks at Peter and says, 
Hey, Satan, tell us about the day you rebuked Jesus. Another joins in, what were you thinking about, Peter? And Peter begins to speak. You know, I didn't like that whole suffering and dying bit. That wasn't what I'd signed up for. That wasn't what the Messiah was about, in my view. I didn't understand then. And the others become quiet. They remember that day as if it was yesterday. How could they ever forget it? And they're only too aware it wasn't only Peter thinking those thoughts. They all were. But it was only Peter who was brave enough or, or impetuous enough to say it. Peter didn't get it. Just before this passage that Lynn read to us, Jesus asked the disciples who people said that he was. And they answered him. Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. And then Jesus asks them. Who do you say I am? And Peter responds, You are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. Peter had correctly identified who Jesus was. Peter had had enough vision to, to see that much clearly. But he didn't understand what it meant. He didn't get what the role of a Messiah was actually meant to be. And if we're honest, we wouldn't have done either if we'd been in the same situation. We've, after all, got the benefit of almost 2,000 years of hindsight. And up to that point in the story, if there'd been, if there'd been a, a certain glamour in following Jesus, if we'd been with him, seeing the adoration of the crowds who had come to him for healing, seeing him put the religious leaders in their place, answering them with wit and imagination, we wouldn't have got it either. Because how would we have reacted after experiencing all these wonderful things with Jesus, when Jesus said that he would suffer, be rejected and killed? and after three days would rise again. And we're told by Mark that he spoke plainly about all of this, and that Peter took Jesus to one side and rebuked him. And then Jesus turned to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Last week, the Gospel reading Included Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. This week, there is another temptation. Another temptation to take the easy way out, but this time delivered by one of his own followers. It's fascinating that each time that Mark records Jesus talking about his death, it's followed by a passage that indicates that the disciples just don't get it. They don't understand what Jesus is here for. That's the first passage from Mark chapter 8. And Peter rebukes Jesus for talking about suffering, about rejection, about death and resurrection. The second time takes place a chapter later in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 30. Again, Jesus talks about being delivered into the hands of men who would kill him and after three days he would rise. This time, Mark actually records that the disciples didn't understand what Jesus meant and they were afraid to ask him about it. Maybe after Peter's experience in chapter 8, they'd learnt their lesson. But it's followed straight afterwards with an account of a journey to Capernaum. And when they were all in the house, Jesus asked his disciples, what were you arguing about on the road? No response. They kept quiet. Because on the way, what they'd been arguing about was about who was the greatest. And none of them wanted to let Jesus know about that. But Jesus knew. He said to them, anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last and the servant of all. 
And he took a little child in his arms and he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Twice Jesus has talked about what's going to happen to him. And twice the disciples have demonstrated they don't get it. They don't get what Jesus is here for. And for a third time, Jesus talks about his death in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 32. That they would be going up to Jerusalem, where the Son of Man would be handed over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They would condemn him to death and would hand him over to the Gentiles who would mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he would rise. And how did the disciples respond? Mark says that then James and John came up to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now that's a really strange request. But Jesus asked them what they meant, what it was that they were asking for. And they replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Jesus said that he, that wasn't in his power to grant. But the other disciples were absolutely furious with James and John. They thought they'd beaten them to it. But Jesus told them that they weren't lorded over others like the rulers of the Gentiles and the, and the high officials. Instead, whoever wanted to become great amongst them must be their servant. And whoever wanted to be the first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, he said, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Three times Jesus has, has talked about his suffering, about his death and resurrection. And three times the disciples have shown by their responses that they haven't got it. Three times they have responded with human ideals of what it means to be powerful. Human ideals of what success looks like. And, and instead, Jesus talks about service, about welcoming others, about denying themselves, about taking up their cross and following him. I wonder whether Jesus ever despaired of his disciples. And if I'm honest, I wonder whether he ever despairs of us too. I wonder whether he ever thought about whether they would ever get it. About whether they would always be looking for material advantage and power. You know, that there must have been a question mark hanging over the first disciples. Especially when right at the end... One of the disciples drew his sword and sliced off the ear of a high priest's servant when they came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then when Peter denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed on that fateful day when Jesus was arrested by the authorities. Three times Peter denied knowing Jesus or being one of his followers. Faith in Jesus is not about the elimination of risk, the preservation of our lives, or the ability to control. Instead, Jesus asks us to risk it all and relinquish control to God. It's what he did, and what he expects those who follow him to do. And I think Peter and the others did eventually grasp this. After all, there are stories of some of the disciples being martyred for their faith, of being prepared to give up their lives because of their faith in Jesus. Now we know that Jesus died for us, so that we can be put in a right relationship with God. We know that Jesus sacrificed himself for us, to open up the gates of heaven so that we might be able to go in. But the question for us is whether we get it any more than his disciples did. Because do we focus on divine priorities or do we focus on our own? This period of Lent, a, a time of preparation for Easter, is a good time to focus on divine priorities, to refocus on God. 
and there is a Lent course starting this Tuesday, this Tuesday evening, looking at, spir looking at spiritual disciplines. Denying ourselves, though, is not about putting ourselves down or about having a low opinion of ourselves. It's not about being out of control or being powerless. Self-denial is more about the choices that we make. And self-denial is, is not really about giving up something for Lent either, because giving up something for Lent can so easily completely miss the point. Uh, and I think most people have had to give up so much over this past year because of COVID-19. I think we might need extra chocolate rather than giving it up. But self-denial is not really about giving up anything at all. Instead, it's about putting others first. In particular, about putting God first. And actually giving up something for Lent can, can so easily be turned into yet another way of putting ourselves first. Doing the opposite. Especially if it's connected with trying to stop some particularly, some, some, some habit that's not particularly good for us. Self-denial reminds us that life isn't ultimately our own. As followers of Jesus, our lives belong to God. But as long as we believe that our lives are just about us, then we will continue to try to exercise power over others, either consciously or unconsciously. We will con still continue to try to save ourselves and to control all our circumstances. But Jesus, on the other hand, very rarely exercised power over others. Instead, he made very different choices. Jesus chose to give in a world that takes, to love in a world that hates, to heal in a love that injures, to give life in a world that kills. He offered mercy when others sought vengeance, forgiveness when others were prepared to condemn, and compassion when others were indifferent. He trusted God's abundance when others said that wasn't enough. With each choice, he denied himself and showed God's presence. So self-denial is really about the choices that we make, about whether we are prepared to put others first, about whether we're prepared to put God first. I don't know if you caught any of the footage of a conversation involving the Queen on Friday where she was talking about having received the COVID-19 vaccine. But she was remarking about how important it was to take the vaccine. But in taking the vaccine, we're thinking of others rather than ourselves. Now, of course, we are protecting ourselves as well because none of us can be sure of how a virus would affect us, even if we've already had it. But we are also protecting each other and we're protecting those in our society who won't be able to have it for medical reasons. There is though, an, an even better example of self-denial in the current COVID-19 pandemic and that's of wearing masks for those who are medically able to do so. And I know it's uncomfortable to wear masks it is for all of us. I'd much rather not have to wear one. And it's a real pain when my glasses missed up as well. But fundamentally, we wear masks. Fundamentally, we wear masks more for the benefit of others rather than for our own benefit. And that's a good example of self-denial because we'd all much rather not be wearing them. And non-medical masks don't provide the wearers with much protection but we do give protection to those around us. But as we start to emerge slowly from lockdown in this country, let us think and pray about what self-denial might look like for us in our current situation, about what putting God first might look like, how we might help each other to grow in faith and how we might enable others to come to faith in Jesus as we consider the imperative of a great commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel to go making disciples of all nations. 
and looking at the resources that we have available to us, how best are we to use them to make disciples in our own church communities and in this circuit? What sacrifices might God be calling us to make for the kingdom, both as individuals and as churches, to enable others to thrive and to grow as followers of Jesus? Because it's not all about us. It's not all about what we want. It's not all about what we expect to receive. Do you remember that famous quote by William Temple, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury between 1942 and 1944? He said that the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who aren't, aren't its members. The church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. Now, I'm not convinced that necessarily stands up to close scrutiny because there are charities that exist for the benefit of others. But you get the point. So how do we make good use of the benefits and the privileges that many of us have received? Many of us have received in, in our lives to broadcast the good news about God. Are we prepared to deny ourselves? I.e. not to put ourselves first, but to put God first. Because that is what this passage challenges us to do. That is what this passage challenges us to do. Amen. We're now going to sing a hymn that takes us through the journey that many of us have probably encountered. And we may well be at different points on it. And sometimes I know we do go backwards. It's number 432 in Singing the Faith. Over oh, bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be when I let the Saviour's pity plead in vain and proudly answered none of you and all of me. Number 432 in Singing the Faith. Over oh, bitter shame and sorrow. Let us pray. 
loving God. We pray for those who are enslaved by their love of money and ensnared by grasping after material possessions. We pray for those who worship wealth and status and are forever searching for fulfilment. We pray that you will bring them to you. Loving God, we pray for those who are trapped by their webs of lies. For those whose whole way of life is stained by greed and pride. For those whose lifestyle is built on the sandy foundations of corruption and falsehood. We pray that you will bring them to you. Loving God, we pray for those who are struggling with temptations that all but overwhelm them. We pray for those for whom the bottom has dropped out of their world. We pray that you will bring them to you. Loving God, we, we pray for those who long for deliverance. We long for deliverance from a prison of apathy and indifference. We pray for those who are seeking a way out of their never-ending circle of hunger, injustice and poverty. We pray that you will bring them to you. And loving God, we pray for ourselves. When we as individuals and churches get distracted. When we drift away from the gospel and from your priorities and fail to follow you. We pray that you will bring us back to you. And almighty God, we pray these prayers in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're going to finish this time of worship by echoing the words of Charles Wesley, expressing our amazement that you, Jesus Christ, our Lord, should die for us. Number 345 in Sing the Faith, number 345. And can it be?
the world is waiting. Go because of your neighbour's need. Go because Jesus came. Go because he goes with you. Go and go in the name of Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. Amen.